On the program today, Dr. Larry Spargimino begins a series with evangelist Dan Goodwin about prophecies and the final jubilee. Are we living in the generation that will see the Antichrist emerge? This generation has certainly made it possible for one man to rule the world. Here now is Dr. Spargimino and Dan Goodwin. I thank you, Marvin, and greetings to all in our listening audience. Our guest is someone very, very special. I've gotten to know him. He's a writer. He's a preacher. Our listening audience loved his book, God's Final Jubilee. And, of course, I'm speaking about evangelist Dan Goodwin. Let's look at each of these topics. The first one, 10 Proofs of the Pre-Trib Rapture, and that is on disc one. Now, Dan, you put this uh, as chapter one in the book, and you made a pretty big deal about settling this matter. And I know it's very, very important with you, and you, you open this series with the proofs of the pre-trib rapture as well. So why is the pre-trib rapture such a big deal? Well, thank you, Brother Larry. Uh, I preached this whole conference uh, back in June this year, just a few months ago, and uh, I started out with that very that very topic, 10 proofs of a pre-tribulation rapture, and uh, I think it is a big deal. And, I, and, and in the book, I mentioned that we've got to get this settled before we go any further, um, because it's such an important thing. I, let me give you some reasons. You, you asked why why is it a big deal with me. Number one, it's a big deal because, hey, it's a, it's a Bible doctrine, and we're supposed to be sound in our doctrine. And I believe the pre-tribulation is a sound biblical doctrine in the Bible. Uh, I think you have to stretch. I think you have to get outside uh, teachers in order to come up with a post-trib rapture. Uh, another reason, uh, why, why is it such a big deal? Uh, because it's the blessed hope. Uh, you know, and I tell people, what's, what's blessed about living through the tribulation period? <laughs> what's blessed about living through the time of God's wrath? And, uh, you know, there's one time in the tribulation, uh, I think it's in Revelation 9. Uh, I call that chapter hell on earth. That's where the devils are let out. And, you know, the Bible says that for five months, nobody dies. Well, that's, uh, how, uh, what's blessed about living in that time? Uh, nothing at all. There's nothing blessed about that. That's why I make a big deal about this. Another reason, Jesus rebuked the people in his day for missing his first coming. We're talking 2,000 years ago now. Um, in Matthew 16, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came, and they tempting him, desired that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Then he says, O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? Now Jesus said that. Now he wasn't talking about the rapture. He was talking about the fact that they missed the signs that pointed to his first coming 2,000 years ago. And he rebuked them pretty harshly for that. Now, I think the same applies today. Uh, I think the Lord would be upset with us if we miss his coming again 2,000 years later. And, and of course, Brother Larry, you and I both know, and you just said it a few minutes ago, so many people have strayed from the truth. So many, so many people are, are now uh, on the other side of things. And, and what a shame when the Lord comes. He even said, when, when I return, shall I find faith on the earth? I just don't think there's very many people looking for the Lord today, and, uh, uh, and I, want, I want people, uh, when they read the book or if they get the, the DVD set here, I, w I want to help them understand the rapture. Well, that's a great goal and a worthwhile goal to help people understand the rapture. I like to call it the great snatch. It really is that, and I know we, uh, whenever we do a program that pushes the pre-trib rapture, we'll get calls. I'll probably get calls, too. And I know the common objection, and I hear it over and over again, you know, they think that if you believe in the pre-trib rapture, you are contributing to worldliness. They say, you know, you're teaching people, just chill out, the great escape is coming, and uh, we're going to be whisked off into the great by and by. And I, I think that's a gross distortion of what we believe and what the Bible teaches. I mean, we believe in separation. We believe in godliness. And and I mean, uh, there are many, many, many of our brothers and sisters right now who are being persecuted horribly right now, and we're seeing it in our, our own country. However, that's still not the tribulation. So we, we don't teach worldliness. Uh, we don't teach escapism. Have you had lots of opposition in your ministry to people who say, you guys are just way off base? 
Uh, and I know there are some some people who are futurists. Boy, they they are post trippers. They think if you're not a post tripper, you ain't gonna make it. Yes, sir. I've had uh, probably since I wrote this book, uh, I've had more opposition than ever before. Uh, now, not everybody. There there are hundreds of people out there that have emailed me and that uh, they're excited and they've they've learned some things. But I am amazed how many people today have 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 become post tribbers and uh, I'm sure we'll get into that a little more in a, in a little bit here, but um, it, it's shocking to me how many people have changed their mind about the rapture. I know many years ago when I was wrestling with this issue, I think Revelation 3.10 is really a blessed verse, you know, where it says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. You know, from the hour of temptation is literally out of the hour of temptation. The Greek New Testament uses the word ek, which means out of. And, you know, it speaks about the hour of temptation coming upon them that dwell upon the earth. If you check the references, and I'm sure you've done it, you can see that that is a phrase that refers to those who are wicked, not Christians. It's coming upon those who are wicked. The tribulation is coming upon them that dwell on the earth. And then it says that we're going to be kept out of the hour of temptation. That speaks about a time period, okay? An hour is a time period. We're not going to be shielded from some of the events in this period. We're going to be kept out of the period. So to me, that, that verse by itself is so powerful. But tell us, uh, Dan, why, why do you think that so many are changing their minds about the pre-trib rapture? Well, I've given a lot of thought to that very question, especially since writing the book, and so many uh, so many people have contacted me, and ministries have contacted me, and they're trying to straighten me out on my doctrine here. But uh, so I gave some thought about it. Well, why today are so many people all of a sudden uh, changing their mind about it? Uh, in fact, I know several preachers who have changed their mind about the pre-tribulation rapture. They now believe that we're going to live through the tribulation, and, and they're bragging about it. They're actually kind of excited about it. And I don't know why, but uh, uh, I, I've got a couple of reasons I jotted down here. Some have lost hope for one reason or another. I think many have lost hope because of the false uh, date setters that have given false hopes in the past. And so now people have just kind of given up on it. I think another reason is very few people today, and you, you know this, you're out there, you're a pastor, very few people have any discernment today. Have you noticed that? Very few people seem to study the Bible or have any knowledge of the Bible and the scriptures, and uh, people don't study today. They, uh, they go to church, they hear a sermon, they sing a few songs, but uh, but that that's about it. They uh, they pretty much believe whatever they're told. They go home and they and the, that's it. I think there's another reason here. The closer we get to the return of the Lord, and this may be the biggest reason why people have changed their mind on the rapture. The closer we get to the return of Jesus Christ, and brother, we're close. The more Satan is working to weaken people's faith and to take away their blessed hope. I think that's why so many today have, have had a change of heart on the rapture. You know, one of the things that people tell me all the time is that uh, somewhere in the year 1850, is some, somebody came up with this doctrine of the rapture and, and the, and the pre-trib rapture. You know, that, that's not true at all. I've got several quotes that I give in, in the book. Uh, one quote from the year 1672, I got Uranius, that, uh, wrote a book against heresies. He lived from 130 to 200 A.D., he believed in a pre-trib rapture. Cyprian, the treatise of Cyprian, he, he's back there in the 200 to 258 A.D. He believed in a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, a guy named uh, Ephraim, the Syrian, in his work uh, on the last times, uh, he lived in the year 300 to 373. These guys all believe in a pre-trib rapture. Uh, this is not a new doctrine. This, this is a Bible doctrine that's always been there. And it certainly is a very encouraging doctrine because Satan knows if, well, if he can get the saints discouraged and if we can come to the point of hopelessness, I mean, despair, discouragement, we no longer believe in the promises of God, we think all, all of these horrible things that are going to happen to us and so forth, and I think, you know, any doctrine of the rapture other than the pre-trip rapture is certainly very, very discouraging. You know... Dan, the fact that the folks who have the church going through a part of the tribulation or going through the tribulation, the fact that they can never quite agree on where the rapture is, that says a lot to me about their view. You know, pre-tribbers, you and me, we're pretty much in agreement. 
we will be taken out before the tribulation period. But as we look at all of these other views that are now being substituted, that are supposed to be the right view, they can't agree amongst themselves. And I would think that that fact in and of itself sends a, a warning light. It's like a flashing red light on the, uh, the dashboard of your car. Yes, sir. I, I agree. And the fact that this is, I think they're the ones that have come up with a new doctrine. They accuse us of coming up with a new doctrine. Uh, I believe the whole Bible teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe every figure and type in the scriptures gives a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, I believe it's something that has been believed for 2,000 years. And I, and I think I proved that in the book with, the, with some of these men that I quoted. Uh, I think they're the ones that have come up with a new doctrine. Well, I know you do such a wonderful job in your book, God's Final Jubilee, and also in the tapes or the discs, the DVDs that we're offering, you make a very compelling case for the pre-trib rapture. And I must say, I think this is a a very uh, significant contribution that you and your ministry has made, because there are so many uh, discouraged saints around. And of course, uh, you know, the, the saints of the tribulation period are not church-age saints. I see a lot of people get this mixed up. Church-age saints have already been taken away. And the saints that we read of in the tribulation period are tribulation saints. So so there are really two groups of saints. We need to remember that. Church-age saints and tribulation saints, just like there are martyrs and there are tribulation martyrs. So I think the denial of the pre-trib rapture comes from uh, not rightly dividing the word, but just blurring and blending things that shouldn't be blurred and blended. Well, as we think about this, Dan, maybe uh, can you give us a few highlights concerning these 10 proofs that you have in your uh, in your presentation? All right, we'll do that. I don't want to bore your, your audience too much with this, you know, we're kind of beating this dead horse to death here, but uh, let me just give a few highlights here of these 10 proofs. I can't give them all, but uh, I'll just pick a few here. The Lord has not appointed us to wrath. That's, that's a reason why I don't believe that we're here for the tribulation. The tribulation is the wrath of God upon this world, as long as, as well as God dealing with Israel. God has not appointed the saved to wrath, the saints. Um, here, here's something that I think folks misunderstand, and here's one of the one of the critics uh, things that they use all the time. They'll tell they'll tell us, you know. Our forefathers all suffered. They were burned at the stake. They were they were beheaded. And, and what right do we have to escape that persecution, they'll say. Uh, and here, here's what my answer to that is. There's a big difference in chastisement or persecution and the wrath of God. Uh, see, the tribulation is not, it, it's the wrath of God. It's God pouring out his wrath on some things. And, uh, I think, uh, I think persecution, we do suffer persecution. I think people are suffering persecution today. Uh, but I think it's a mistake to claim that the tribulation period is a time of persecution. There is going to be persecution, as you mentioned a minute ago. The, the tribulation saints are going to be persecuted. But, uh, I don't think that that's a valid excuse for making us go through the tribulation because, uh, there's a big difference in persecution and the wrath of God. God has promised that he's not appointed us to wrath in First Thessalonians. Romans 8.1, there's no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus, no judgment. Uh, John 5.24, there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And uh, another reason why uh, we're not going to be here for the tribulation, because there's no mention of the church after Revelation 4. Now, this is pretty big. Uh, in Revelation 2 and 3, the entire church age is mentioned there. I, I believe those seven churches are literal, but I believe they're also a type of the entire 2,000-year age of the church. Isn't it interesting, when you get to chapter 4, verse 1, it says, after these things. After what things? After the church age. Then it says, a door was opened in heaven, and I beheld as of a trumpet. A uh, trumpet said, come up hither. And John I believe that's a type of the rapture right there in Revelation 4.1. After Revelation 4.1, all the way to chapter 19, the tribulation takes place, and the church is not mentioned one time. Uh, why is that? Because we're not here. We're gone. We've been taken out. Uh, the Old Testament types uh, in the Bible tell us of a pre-tribulation rapture. Enoch was removed from God's wrath before the flood came. Lot was delivered from Sodom before the fire fell. Noah, the Bible says, was lifted up above the flood waters, and the door was closed. He, he didn't suffer the wrath. He didn't suffer the flood. And, uh, well, let me give him one more thing here. 
you know, there's a contrast, and I give a chart in the book, and I think I talk about it in the DVD. Uh, there's a there's a chart there's, there's a contrast between the first coming of Christ, which is the rapture, and the second coming of Christ, which is when he comes on the white horse. Uh, and the contrast is this: he's coming for us in the rapture. He's coming with us at the second coming. See the difference there? He's coming as a thief in the night for this for, for us at the rapture. But the Bible says, he's, every eye shall see him. Now, that, Brother Larry, that can't be the same event. He comes as a thief, and he comes and every eye sees him. That's two separate events. That's the rapture first. Seven years later, every eye shall see him on the white horse. And I'm looking forward to that event, by the way. That's Revelation 19, 11. Um, the, the rapture is imminent. It, it, it could happen in a moment. I want to be watching for it. But the second coming is not imminent. If if you if we were here for the tribulation period, I promise you, I could tell you the exact day of the of Christ coming on the white horse. There'd be no mystery about that at all. And uh, he's coming uh, on the white horse at the, uh, exactly seven years after the after the peace treaty is signed. There'd be no mystery about that. So, uh, so that's some things. I hope that'll be a help to your listeners about the the pre-trib rapture. I think it really is. And, you know, when we look at the uh, the rapture, the scriptures concerning the rapture, it's a time of peace and safety, and people are just going merrily about their business. But then when you look at the second coming, the attendant circumstances, the things that are going on, that, that's a time of strife, a time of war, a time of battle, a time of plagues, a time of judgment. And to confuse one with the other, that they're just so so different. It's kind of like me saying... You know, in in the wintertime, when we come to the fall, the geese are flying south, of course. And then when it warms up, they're flying north. And and they can't be the same events. They've got to be different events because the attendant circumstances are different. So I think it is very clear to me. And uh, I know if folks want to hold the other view, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I think we need to we need to love the Lord and we need to pray for wisdom. We need to pray for understanding and. I certainly hope that uh, folks don't pick up the telephone and give me a tongue lashing. Although, you know, one of the things I've noticed, Dan, is that the post-tribbers, many of the ones who call me up, are mean. Really mean. Ah, <laughs> You know, and I think that doctrine makes you mean. But when yeah, we think I'm of... I'm hoping they call you instead of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable to me. I, I, you know, I think if you believe the truth and if you're settled in the truth, you'll have a peace about it. You'll have a sweetness about it. But I've had, you know, I, I, we deal with the New World Order. We deal with Islam. We deal with uh, the radical gay agenda. But some of the meanest calls and the meanest people I've ever spoken to on the telephone, and my 800 number is open to the whole world, are those who think we're going through the tribulation. And my, uh, you know, hey, there's got to be something wrong with that. And uh, and I'm not trying to sound mean myself, but I'm I must say I'm really unhappy about these folks who have no Christian charity. <laughs> when when they, they and I'm sure there's probably some out there steaming now. Hey, we need to calm down, love the Lord, look to Jesus, and and uh, pray for one another. We are suffering greatly. I think our country is in a moral freefall. We've you know we've seen evil, and we are seeing evil in high places, but also in churches. Many of the churches, our land, our going off the track. Dan, thank you for being with us once again, and I know you're excited about a wedding made in heaven. So what is the wedding you're speaking about of in this message, and why is it so important? Yes, sir. Greetings again, Brother Larry. It's an honor to be back on your show today. And uh, one of the DVDs in the set is called A Wedding Made in Heaven. It's probably one of my favorite topics to preach on. You, You don't really make anybody mad with this one. And uh, but it's really a love story. Um, but it's a it's a beautiful picture. There are many truths in the Bible that we miss today because, quite honestly, because we're not Jewish. Um, a lot of the Bible pr- truths of the Bible are, are 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 also showed in the customs of Israel. The customs that Israel practiced in Bible days, whether they fully understood them or not actually coincided with Scripture and often pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of the parables and stories that Jesus gave are not fully understood by us today because we lack an understanding of these Jewish customs. The Jewish customs kind of like take a flashlight and shine it on these truths. 
where if you read uh, a, a scripture in the Bible, sure, we, we can get something out of it, but if we understood these, these customs of the Jews, it would be like shining a bright light on that passage, and it would, it would come alive for us. And uh, it's certainly true of the story of the Jew, Jewish wedding. Uh, Revelation 21.9 is, is very interesting. Uh, one of the angels, one of the seven angels, it says, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and he talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now, what does that mean? He's talking about the church. He's talking about the saints. He's talking about you and me. He's saying, Come here, I want to show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. Well, who's the Lamb? The Lord Jesus Christ. Who's the bride? The church. The saints that were raptured, and all the saints in heaven for the entire 2,000-year church age were the bride of Christ. The rapture is, in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the groom, coming in the middle of the night to get his bride. In, the, in, in this message that I preached, I give a step-by-step -step lesson about how a man in Bible days would propose to a young lady. It's a beautiful love story. Uh, a young man, how would a young man propose to a, a young lady, and how uh, it was a wonderful type of Christ coming in the rapture to claim his bride. And a beautiful story. Well, as I think of the Hebrew customs that are so important, and as I think, for example, of the feast of Israel, the fall feast, the spring feast, and you certainly have dealt with that so, so ably and so wonderfully, and, and you're right, it's absolutely essential that we understand something about the Jewish background, not only of the Old Testament, but also of the New Testament. I think you uh, do a wonderful job on that. Now, you've, you've been speaking about the uh, overview of the Jewish custom, how a young man chose a bride, and uh, how it relates to Christ and the church. Now, what about Matthew twenty four thirty six? Explain for our listeners how this Jewish custom fits in with Matthew twenty four thirty six. Yes, sir, that's an interesting verse. It, say, it says this, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Of course, the Lord Jesus spoke those words. And what he was talking about, basically, is the customs of the Jewish wedding. Uh, what would happen in Bible days? A young man would choose a, a girl. He may know her, he may not. might be a perfect stranger. Uh, there may have been some courting, uh, maybe not, but... Uh, a young man would choose somebody he wants to be his bride. He would make his offer of marriage with the offering of some sort of a gift, like uh, uh, Rebecca was given some bracelets and things. He would, uh, he would make his offer. If she accepted his hand in marriage, she would sign a contract. Uh, hey, try that today, brother. <laughs> uh, guess what? We've got a contract called the Bible. You and I are espoused to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is our wedding contract. She is now engaged. When she accepts to marry him, she's now engaged. Uh, the Bible calls it she's espoused or betrothed. It would, it would, by the way, it would take a divorce to break this engagement. Uh, Joseph was going to have to divorce Mary. The Bible says he was going to put her away privily, quietly. He didn't want to shame her because he loved her. He didn't understand what was going on until, until the angel showed up and told him what, what was going on. Uh, he was going to have to divorce his espoused bride, Mary. They weren't even married yet, uh, but they were espoused. It was a pretty big deal in those days. When you got engaged, it, it would take a divorce, a bill of divorcement to end that. The groom, if she accepts and she signed the contract, now here's where it gets interesting. The groom returns home to his father's house, and he begins building a home for his, for his espoused wife. Now, our groom, Jesus, has also gone home to his house, to the Father's house. John fourteen six says, I've got to prepare a place for you. He's gone back to the Father's house. He's preparing uh, a place for us in heaven. And the Bible says, uh, and I will come again. What is, it, what is that talking about? He's coming back to claim his bride. Uh, now, only the father decides when it's time for the young man, the son, to go get his bride. That's what Matthew 24 is about. Um, of that day and hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. And uh, when, when the father decides it's time, he tells the son with the blowing of trumpets, and the young man would get on his horse, and he'd get his groomsmen on their horses. They'd ride down to the city, and uh, they'd look for the lantern in her window. She'd have an oil lamp lit, and uh, he'd look for her, her window, and he'd, a shout would be made. And she's supposed to be ready, Brother Larry, 
she's supposed to have her bag packed. Uh, she she don't have to text anybody. She don't call anybody. She gets her bag. She runs down the stairs. He carries her over the threshold, puts her on the horse, and away they go. That's that's how that's the rapture right there. Um, the, this wedding is, is this this Jewish custom of a of a wedding fits perfectly with the word of God, and it proves a pre tribulation rapture. There's no post trib rapture here. This is pre trib, and this is very exciting to me. It certainly is, and as I think of the topic, the title of Wedding Made in Heaven, um, as a pastor, I've taken part in many weddings. The brides are so wonderful. Uh, I love Revelation 19, verse 7. It says, uh, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Made herself just, ready. Yeah. Right, you're just speaking about that. And then it says, And to her was granted that she would be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Wow, what a beautiful, beautiful picture. I've, of course, taken part in funerals, and uh, the, the funeral of a saint is a blessed thing. We, uh, you know, we know that brother or sister is with the Lord, but I, I just love to take part in weddings. As a matter of fact, in about three weeks, I've uh, got a wedding, and the bride and groom want to be married out in a big wheat field. And one thing we're not going to have is a unity candle, because the, <laughs> the wind blows very hard in Oklahoma, and no candle would survive. But uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's it's you know, so you precious. Mentioned, you, you mentioned the, important, the, 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 the sweetness of this wedding. Now, I wonder how many of your listeners have really sat down and thought about this. They are going to be the bride of Jesus Christ. You know, the job of this young lady while he's gone building the house, she has something she's supposed to be doing. She, well, you read it in that verse. She's to be preparing herself as a, as a bride adorned for her husband. Our job down here on this earth is to prepare ourselves to be the best bride that we can be. We're supposed to be clean and pure and moral and righteous. And what a shame when the Lord comes back and the trumpet sounds. I'm afraid most, most of God's people, most of the saints, are going to be going to hold their head down when they face the Lord Jesus Christ in, in, in the clouds, because we're 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 just not what we're supposed to be. And what what a shame that is! I think if we get a handle on this truth about what we are, we're the bride of Jesus Christ. I think it would motivate us to live a clean life and uh, and to be holy again. Well, hallelujah and amen to that. I think uh, all of the truths that you and I deal with these basic Bible doctrines, they are saving doctrines, but they're also sanctifying doctrines. They they get people saved, but then those who are saved, as they study about these glorious truths, we become sanctified as we see our blemishes and our cracks and our faults. And, you know, as we get closer to Christ, the the brightness of the light shines upon us, and we begin to notice those little, little cracks and little blemishes. And my, how the Lord can use His Word to uh, sanctify us. But let's move on. Disc 3... Are we the last generation? Now, you mentioned some things that must be in place before the rapture. Can you give us some of these things and explain what you mean when you say these things must be in place? Yeah, no, this, this gets a little, uh, a little, I could be misunderstood here, and I hope I won't be, but uh, because, you know, there are no signs for the rapture. We, I'm sure your listeners understand that. All the signs in the Bible are pointing to the second coming of Christ at the end of all things. But we know when we get close to that that we're even closer to the rapture because the rapture is, is uh, basically seven years earlier. Uh, I call it 2,520 days, but that's for another that's for another program. But uh, seven basically seven years before the second coming of Christ, we're taken out of here. Um, so the signs in the Bible are all pointing towards the end. Um, but, here, but here's what I mean by that. There's a verse in Matthew 24. Uh, are we the last generation? There has to be some things in place. If Christ is coming soon, there's some things that have got to be in place. The Bible says this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Uh, now, those things are going to be fulfilled, and there's some things that are going to happen during the tribulation. However, if, uh, if, the, if the rapture had happened in George Washington's day, uh, we've got a problem. Uh, George Washington had a flintlock. You can't shoot very far with a flintlock. They didn't have cell phones. They couldn't communicate. They had to send a guy on a horse to, to ride across the state. It's, and it would take him maybe a week uh, to, to get somewhere and, and give people a warning about something. Um, that There's no way that the tribulation could have took place for the one world order in George Washington's day. Uh, now, somebody is going to be alive when the trumpet sounds. Uh, I believe you and I are going to be. <laughs> Someone is going to be that final generation upon this earth. I believe we're it. 
Um, could it, could we be that last generation? If we are, there's certain things that have to be in place when the saints are removed and the tribulation takes place. There is a system that must be in place, a mindset that must be in place. The final generation on the earth, right before the trumpet sounds, has got to be ready to move rapidly into the events that unfold during the tribulation. I believe we are that final generation. I believe the world is ready to move into the one world system controlled by the Antichrist. I believe he's alive and well today. I believe he's, uh, I don't, I don't know for sure who he is. I got a few suspicions that, uh, the Antichrist has to be a mature man ready to take over. He has to be ready to be crowned in Revelation 6, right after the rapture, when Christ takes the book out of the right hand of the Father, the Lamb, takes the book, opens the first seal, the Antichrist comes on a white horse, because he's the counterfeiter. He comes just like Jesus. Comes on a white horse, and a crown is placed on his head. He becomes the head of the one world order. Now, if that's going to happen right after the rapture, Brother Larry, that's the point of the message. If that happens right after the rapture, that Antichrist has got to be alive and ready. The kingdom that he's going to rule has to be ready. Um, the world must be ready to come together as, as one. The one, uh, one man must be able to rule that one world. Technology has to be, be possible for him to rule. Uh, the world has got to be able to destroy itself. By the way, that was never possible until you and I's generation. It was not possible even in 1945. Uh, it was not possible. It's possible today the world could destroy itself. Uh, today, no, no doubt about that. And uh, we live in a time right now when everything has become global. Everything right now is in place so that if the Lord came today, and I pray that he does, but if the Lord came today, everything is in place. There's nothing, no, no missing links here. Everything is ready. That's what, that's what I mean by that. Some things have got to be in place. And, and I believe uh, anybody that takes an honest look at this thing will realize, hey, Everything is in place. Everything's ready uh, for the Lord to return. I say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, what you've given as an explanation regarding these things must be in place, I think, is excellent. I, I've never heard it done so well because you don't destroy the doctrine of imminence, and that is a very important doctrine, and yet there are some things that have to be in place, and you're absolutely right. We are dealing with some really important issues. We're talking about the question, are we the last generation? You know, you mentioned Israel, the fact that they are back in the land. That's very significant. Do you believe that this is the budding of the fig tree that's spoken of in Matthew 24? You know, most Bible prophecy preachers believe that the fig tree is a type of Israel. Uh, I agree with that myself. I, I believe the fig tree is a type of Israel. Uh, now I may differ with some some of you listeners, and, and maybe some of your staff. I don't know, but I'll just tell you. You ask me. You ask me. I'll tell you what I believe. I, <laughs> and uh, and 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 I hope your listeners will call you and complain to you, and not me. But anyway, I believe in May of 1948, when the United Nations gave that property to Israel. I mean, we're talking a couple of years after uh, World War II. The Jews were scattered. They were they were in really bad shape. Uh, they, and we claim, we call that the rebirth of Israel. And, uh, and, and that's true that they were reborn there. They, they, they came back to their homeland sometime in May 1948. Here's what I believe, Brother Larry. I believe in 1948, I believe the fig tree took root. I believe it took root. But I believe this. I believe the fig tree budded in 1967 in the Six Day War because what happened in 67 is Israel got the city of Jerusalem, which they did not have in 1948. I think it took root in 1948. I think it budded in 1967. And if you do the math from 48 to 2018, that's 70 years. That's interesting. And But if you go from 67 to 2000, the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, that's 50 years. That That's kind of a jubilee, isn't it? So that, that's my feeling on the fig tree. Well, that's certainly a good explanation. Now, let's look at the Laodicean church age. You speak about the Laodicean church age, and you speak about that often. Can you explain to, to our listeners what you mean by the Laodicean church age? Well, very simply, uh, I think we mentioned in the, the program yesterday, the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, I believe those are literal churches that existed. Letters, uh, the, the book of Revelation was sent to each of those churches. They each had a pastor. 
uh, the angel of each church, I believe, was their pastor. And uh, But I believe that they're also, those seven churches are also figurative of some things. Um, but thirdly, I believe those seven churches have a prophetic interpretation. I believe the seven churches are prophetic of the, the entire 2,000-year church age, the New Testament age. And, uh, of course, it starts with Ephesus and ends with Laodicean. Laodicean is, without any doubt, the worst of those seven churches. There's more negative things said about that church. Uh, in fact, I'll just read a few of them here. I know thy works, thou art neither cold nor hot. I wish, I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, he's talking about the church in Laodicea, this is Jesus speaking, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That's pretty rough. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And he goes on from there, but uh, that's a pretty bad description of a church. However, Brother Larry, that's a pretty good description of the church in, in, in the world today, especially here in America. Uh, that, that's what we are. We fit the description of this Laodicean church. I believe that, that we are that final church age. I believe we're in it. And, uh, and I believe uh, that Christ comes in Revelation 4 in the rapture at the end of this Laodicean church age. And we are, we're there, brother. Well, I agree with you amazingly because, number one, I agree that the seven churches are actually historical churches that existed way back then. But number two, I think you can look at each of the specific churches and, and see a parallel. They are periods of time in church history. And what do we have? We've got seven churches, and we know that we're in the last days, the very end of the last days, and, and you describe the church today and compare it to the Laodicean church, and of course that's the last church, and hey, that says that we're about to hear the trumpet, and the dead in Christ are going to rise. So I think that's a tremendous, tremendous explanation. There is uh, lukewarmness. You know, I think lukewarmness is a very, very serious thing. I used to teach in uh, Bible college. I also was a Christian school administrator. I used to teach in the high school. And, and I found that when students are lukewarm regarding their grades, for example, there are other kind of squeaking by with a C minus or a C, maybe a C plus, they're not really alarmed. Now, if they're starting to fail, they really get shook up. And the fact that the church today is kind of lukewarm, you know, not really gone, but just lukewarm. Hey, that's dangerous. You know, the Lord says, I, I wish you were hot or cold. You know, that'd be better than being lukewarm. And I like hot coffee, even in the summertime. Maybe it's because I'm, I don't know what, but I like hot coffee. But, you know, lukewarm coffee, ugh, it's awful. <laughs> or even hot tea is good, or cold tea, but lukewarm tea, and I think that's exactly what the Lord is saying. I feel like spitting, you know. Hey, you guys down there, let's wake up. So, uh, well, wow, this is so exciting. Dan, you're doing a wonderful job. I think you've made some uh, really deep prophetic truths, so clear, so manifest, so open to our audiences and friends tomorrow in our next broadcast. We're going to be speaking about the seven feasts of the Lord, and that is really a gem. All of this has been sparkling jewels, to say the least, the way Dan has been bringing out all these precious truths from the Word of God. Thank you, dear brother Dan, for doing a great job in lifting up our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, let's proceed. Tell us about the seven feasts of the Lord. Share with our listeners where they can read about the seven feasts in the Bible. They can read about the seven feasts in that book that everybody shuns and stays away from, one of the Old Testament books, the book of Leviticus. And uh, chapter 23, I, I, I challenge your listeners to study these seven feasts. It'll, it'll literally open up the Bible to them. And uh, that song you're just quoting about, I love to tell the story, the seven feasts is the whole story of the Christian life. I have three chapters in the book on the seven feasts. And I think they're mentioned probably in every chapter of the book, something about the seventh feast. But life begins at Passover. You've got to have a Passover in your life. That's salvation, the blood applied to your heart. And that's salvation. That's the first step of the Christian life. And uh, and then, of course, the end of it all is the last feast, which is tabernacles. And uh, that's uh, the tabernacle means, literally means to dwell with. What does that mean? God wants to dwell with man. But God cannot dwell with man until we, uh, until we have a, a, a Passover in our life where the blood is applied and we're saved and our spirit, which is dead, is re reborn. We become born again. 
that's the purpose of it all. These seven feasts, they're, they're just amazing. When you begin to learn about these seven feasts, the whole Bible will open up. Leviticus 23, the whole chapter, all seven of them are mentioned there. I love Leviticus 23. A while back, back in the spring, I preached a series at uh, the church that I pastor on Leviticus 23. You've got the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Pentecost. You know, I never realized it until I started studying the passage that in Leviticus 23:17, it says the loaves are to be baked with leaven. Hey, leaven's a no-no, but here, these loaves are to be baked with leaven. I kind of look at that as speaking about the church age. I don't know. How do you, how do you see the leaven there in Leviticus 23, 17? Yeah. What's your take on that? And that? That's from what I've studied, and most of the prophecy people that I've read after have said that that's the Gentiles and the Jews coming together for the church age. That's the way I understood it. Well, you know, when I was reading that, um, I had never seen that before, and it just, it was like God reached out from the pages of Scripture with his hand and slapped me on the face and stopped me right there. And I, that's what, one of the reasons why I love the Word of God. It's, it's so, so it's living and vital and powerful. It, it, you know, it's, it's wonderful. Well, you talk about in your messages about the seven feasts or God's prophetic time clock. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, nothing has helped my understanding of the Bible and the Christian life like the, like studying these seven feasts. The seven, uh, let me give your listeners some, something to, to, jump, to, to chew on here a little bit. The, there are seven feasts uh, in the Bible. Now, there's some other feasts, but I'm talking about the seven feasts. There's, there's, there's a few other feasts that, are, that don't uh, apply to these. But these seven feasts in Leviticus 23 take place in the first seven months of the Jewish calendar from the month Nisan, which is usually April on our calendar, to the month Tishri, which is September, October area. Um, these seven feasts take uh, uh, these the, the seven feasts take place in seven months of the Jewish calendar. I believe there's going to be seven thousand years of human history. The six days of the creative week in Genesis one, and on the seventh day God rested. That's the last seven thousand years, the kingdom age. The seven feasts are the whole world in a nutshell. <laughs> as well as a type of the entire Christian life. As I said earlier, we all start in Egypt at Passover. Everybody starts in Egypt as a lost man. Passover is how I get between uh, be, uh, from, from being lost and being dead in trespasses and sins and being born again, being regenerated, being regened. And uh, Passover is what does that. We must get the blood applied to the door of our hearts, just like they put the blood on the doorpost of their homes, and uh, and, we're, and they're the firstborn was saved that night. We have to have the blood applied. That's the first step of the Christian life. Step two is we begin, begin to get leaven, the leaven of sin out of our life. That's unleavened bread. Feast of unleavened bread starts the evening of Passover, starts that night, and lasts for seven days. And the Jews had to get leaven out of their house as a figure, a type of getting sin out. See, we can't mix these up. You don't get sin out of your life and then get the blood applied. You get the blood applied, then you begin working on your life to get sin out of your life. The next step in their life was they crossed the Red Sea. Uh, and I've studied this all out. It took them three days to get to the Red Sea. They crossed the Red Sea, Brother Larry, on the Feast of First Fruits. Nissan 17, the 17th of Nissan. A lot of things happened on that day. The, the walls of Jericho fell on that day. Jesus rose from the grave on that day. Um, very interesting. Uh, they crossed the Red Sea, and Stephen in Acts 7 mentioned that, uh, that they were the church in the wilderness when they crossed the Red Sea. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul talks about uh, they were baptized of Moses in the, in, the, uh, in the fire and in the sea there. So that's the next step. We've got to get into the assembly. The assembly. They're called an assembly, a church in the wilderness after they cross the Red Sea. So you get the blood applied, that's salvation. You, get, you begin the process of cleaning your life up, that's unleavened bread. You, uh, you uh, cross the Red Sea of baptism, you get, you get into the church, you get with God's people. The next step was not Canaan land. The next step was south, down to the mountain, and Moses goes up to the mountain, gets the, gets the word of God, the Ten Commandments, comes down, and of course they've made the golden calf, and they're dancing, and they're in nakedness, and fornication, and, and uh, by the way, uh, that was the Feast of Pentecost, when he came down and broke the commandments, and, and uh, made them drink the, the golden calf, that was the Feast of Pentecost. The Bible says about 3,000 died that day. 1,500 years later, on the last Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, 
the Bible says about 3,000 were added to the church. The lesson there is the law killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And uh, so those first four feasts all all embody the Christian life, and getting saved, getting sin out of your life, getting with, you know, into the assembly of God's people, getting the Word of God in you so that you can make it to the Canaan land and live the victorious life and fight the battles for God. And uh, there's three more feasts on the calendar, and they're fall feasts. They all take place in the last month, the seventh month, month of Tishri. You've got trumpets. They call that Rosh Hashanah. You've got atonement, Yom Kippur, and then the, the, the last feast is tabernacles. These all take place in that last fall month, the seventh month on their calendar. These haven't been fulfilled yet, Brother Larry. These are all future things. I believe trumpet is a type of the rapture. I believe uh, it, it is a type of Christ coming to, to get us out of here. I believe he comes back on the white horse seven years later on the Day of Atonement, and I believe he sets up the kingdom, and that's, that's tabernacle. So um, the, the, the fall feast are God's prophetic time clock of future events, uh, trumpet, atonement, and tabernacles. And uh, like I say, an understanding of these feasts really opens up the Bible and, and, and will help folks understand some things. Well, there are so many wonderful parallels. You've been bringing out some of them just now, and I, I do notice, Dan, that uh, after the Feast of, of Pentecost, uh, there is a four-month gap. Wow! And then you've got the future fall feast. That, that seems to me to be like the church age. Isn't that amazing? And then the next feast is the Feast of Trumpets. Ta-da! For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise. <laughs> And by the way, that, that feast is the feast no man knows the day of the hour of, because if it's, it's cited by, when they cite the, the new moon in the sky, of course their calendar goes by the moon. Day one is the little sliver of the moon, and the middle of the month is, uh, is the full moon, and then the moon begins to shrink. And uh, uh, So on the Feast of Trumpets, it's not announced until the two witnesses went up on the hillside, and when they see the moon, the little sliver of the moon, it's called the new moon, they would go back down to the temple, they'd tell the high priest, whoever it was that year, They'd say, we've sighted the moon, the trumpets would be blown, that would begin the, uh, the Feast of, uh, of Trumpets. And that's, wh uh, that's what the Lord meant. No man knows the day of the hour. It could happen at 5 p.m., that would be one day, or it could happen at 7 p.m., that's now the next day, because their day ends at sundown, and the new day begins. So that Feast of Trumpets could happen on one of two days. No, no man knows. Well, now, in the message, you spoke of the Jubilee. Uh, tell our listen how, uh, listeners how the Jubilee fits uh, in with the seven feasts. What, what place does it hold? What role does it play? Now, the Jubilee is not mentioned until you get to Re uh, Leviticus chapter 25. Uh, very, very interesting. Let, let me give them a little background here. The Jubilee takes place on the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur. That's the sixth feast. Remember, you got Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost. Then your fall feast, you've got trumpets, and then Day of Atonement and Tabernacle. The Day of Atonement is the sixth feast. That's the day that the, that the Jubilee begins. The Jubilee takes place on that feast every 49 years, um, every seventh sabbatical cycle. Let me, let me explain what I mean by that. There are three, there's several Sabbaths, but there's three main Sabbaths that the Bible talks about. The first is the seven-day Sabbath. That's that. That's the um, that's the Sabbath uh, of the the seventh day, the, the Saturday, and uh, Jesus, uh, God rested on the seventh day in Genesis one after He created everything. Um, then you've got um, then you've got the seventh year Sabbath. That's the the Sabbath, what we call the the sabbatical, uh, the land sabbatical, where the the land rests. After six years, they would uh, they would not plant their gardens on the seventh year. They had to let the land rest. Um, on that day, by the way, on that seventh year, all the slaves were set free. The debt, all debt was forgiven. Uh, pretty exciting. Well, for, uh, seven of those sabbatical years would be 49 years. I hope I'm not confusing your listeners here, but um, every seventh year is a sabbatical year. Seven of those, which is 49 years, is also a sabbatical year, but it's a special one. It's a jubilee. Uh, something else takes place. Besides the debt being forgiven and all the slaves set free, something else happens on the Jubilee. All property went back to the original owner. Uh, now, you can imagine uh, how big that is. Uh, I believe Jesus comes back on that day. I believe he comes on a Jubilee year because Jesus is coming back with the seven sealed book in his hand, which I believe is the title deed to planet Earth. And I believe he's coming back on the Jubilee year to reclaim the Earth. 
after the after the seven year tribulation, the seventieth week of Daniel. And I believe Christ comes and he uh, comes on the white horse. He ends the Battle of Armageddon, marches down the uh, Kidron Valley and up into the Eastern Gate, and he uh, reclaims Jerusalem and takes possession of the earth. And it's all a jubilee. And uh, and I believe that's the end of the six thousandth year, and then we'll begin the seventh feast, which is. The, the the day of uh, tabernacles, which, by the way, when you read Zechariah chapter 12 and chapter 14, you'll find that we're going to keep the tab- Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, we're going to keep that feast every year during the millennium. And that, that's pretty interesting. Boy, the next section, Disc 5, what in the world is going on? Now, you spoke of many wild things happening around the world. Uh, and indeed, they, there are many wild, unbelievably wild, and uh, some sometimes very distressing. But uh, but certainly, I agree they're wild. Uh, what would you say to uh, someone who who argues that there have always been strange and crazy things happening? I mean, there's been wars, there's been persecution, um, there's been you know people fighting, there's been diseases, the uh, bubonic plague. Uh, how do you answer that question where people say, well, hey, there's nothing new going on. This, this has always been, uh, you know, about normal for planet Earth. What, what's your response? Right. Good question. And I, and I get that response many times. Here, here's how I answer people. I would say there's always been crazy things going on. Surely there have. Um, I just read the book of Judges. <laughs> You'll see some crazy things. But I would say, I would say this. I would say that it has never happened as rapidly and with the magnitude that is happening today. Well, the things are happening so fast today, you, you can't even keep up with it. That that would be my answer to the to the, the to the the guy who wants to argue that. Right, right. And the fact that Israel's now back in the land and a nation—that's, I mean, that's I think that's very very significant. And uh, the we've never we've never had the the technology that we have today, technology that actually means that we can read the book of, of Revelation literally and not allegorically. I imagine 100 years ago you had to allegorize some of that stuff. It looked like it would never happen, you know, for people all over the world to see the bodies of the two witnesses. Now, how, how could that happen? But now with satellite TV and CNN and all that, uh, so, uh, yeah, there, there's always been these things, but they're all coming together. They're happen- happening very quickly. Um, even our great nation, my, I'm so, I really grieve about our nation. You know, America has been, been so wonderful, but uh, some of our leaders, they, they seem to be against us and not for us. And, and people love it. You know, people are so carnal. They say, hey, give me the, uh, the, the political candidate who promises me the most. We can have this. We can have that. We can have our chocolate cake and our pie and eat it. And um, I know Ronald Reagan once said, uh, the government that can give you everything is the government that can take it all away. Friends, watch out. I hope you don't think that way. Only trust in the Lord. But, uh, you know, we talk about what in the world is going on. You mentioned Palm Sunday and Christ riding in on a donkey. Uh, you really made a big uh, deal of this event in history. Tell us what this is all about and why you're so excited about it. Yeah, Palm Sunday is a, is a much huger event than people realize. You know, Daniel 9 talks about the 70 weeks of years, 490 years to turn upon Israel. At the end of the 69th week, or 483 years, Messiah is cut off. This is speaking of Christ. And this event takes place during the 10th to the 14th of the month Nisan, which is the Passover uh, in Israel. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. I'm sure your listeners know the story. The, the disciples, they go get a donkey, but they bring it over to him. He gets on, he rides down the hill through the Kidron Valley, and hundreds of people come out, and they put palm leaves on the ground. That's why they call it Palm Sunday. They put palm leaves on the ground, and he rides in, and they cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. Uh, that was the tenth of the month. That was the month, uh, that was the day that we call Palm Sunday. It was four days before Passover. By the way, it was the exact day that in Israel you were supposed to choose a lamb out of your flock to be the Passover lamb. And this, this is really interesting. The Bible says, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt, the foal of an ass. Jesus, their king, rode into Jerusalem. I believe on that day, I believe it's the day prophesied in Daniel 9, to be the, the, the end of the 483rd year, the 69th week ends, the day Messiah rides in, and he's cut off on Passover. He's killed. And uh, according to Exodus 12, Passover starts not on the 14th with the lamb, 
that starts on the 10th with the choosing of the lamb. So Passover is really a four-day event with the choosing of the lamb and watching it for four days and then killing it, shedding its blood, putting it on the doorpost. Jesus goes in, makes a whip. This all happens now. Right after he goes in the eastern gate, he chases out the money changers with the whip. The next day, he comes back out of the out of the city. He sees a fig tree. Remember the story? There's no fruit on it. He curses it. I never used to understand what that was about. Now I understand it. He's getting ready to be rejected by the Jews. What's the fig tree a type of? The, 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 the nation of Israel. He curses the fig tree because there's no fruit on it. They're going to be cursed for 2,000 years. And uh, now he's getting ready to deal with them. But Messiah is cut off right there at Passover. I do not believe we, we can know who the Antichrist is. Uh, uh, this is an exciting chapter in the book, an exciting DVD. Uh, probably I get more responses on this chapter, what in the world is going on, than any other chapter. But you know what? The, 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 the president could, he fits the description of the Antichrist. I'm not saying he is, but I pointed out some interesting things here. Uh, I don't believe the Antichrist will be revealed till we're out of here. However, the president seems to meet the biblical requirements, and I illustrate in the message uh, that, that Obama actually fulfilled Palm Sunday in 2013. Uh, you know, Satan has a counterfeit to everything that God has. He has counterfeit Bible, has a counterfeit spirit, counterfeit Trinity. Uh, you got the you got Antichrist, you got Satan representing the Father, uh, Antichrist representing the the the, the uh, uh, the Antichrist representing Christ, and the false prophet represents the Holy Spirit, the false trinity there. That's all going to come into play during the tribulation. 8.13 p.m. on 3.13.2013. I'm not making this up. This, is, this, is, this really happened. Seven days exactly before President Obama arrives in Israel. Guess what day the president arrives in Israel? Nissan 10, Palm Sunday. It wasn't a Sunday, but it was the 10th of the month, Nissan, the same day 2,000 years ago that Jesus Christ rode in on the donkey. Same day. Uh, by the way, the president was also supported by a donkey. The Democratic Party has a donkey for a, for a symbol. Now, now, people can be skeptical of this all they want. I'm just saying this, this, stuff, is, this stuff is out there. I mean, what do you do with this stuff? This is, uh, this is very... Very interesting, and there's a whole lot more than that, but we don't have time to get into it. But I'm not saying that the president is the Antichrist. I'm saying he certainly fits the description. You know, there's a lot of questions about the president's birth, uh, where he was born, just like there were questions about Jesus' birth. Remember that Philip came to Nathaniel, come see a man, is not this the Messiah? Remember what Nathaniel said? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He knew the scriptures. He knew that Messiah doesn't come from Nazareth, comes from Bethlehem. See, they, they didn't understand the birth of Christ. They missed that. And uh, there's, there's a lot of questions about this guy in the White House. We don't know anything about him. Who knows anything about his past? There's not one girl that's ever come forward and said, I knew him at college or I dated him. No, it's like he came from nowhere. Uh, that's all I'm saying. I, I'm not saying he's the Antichrist. I'm saying there's some, there's some strange things going on, and maybe we ought to look at some of this. Well, I agree. And, of course, First John 2.18 says, you know, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know it's the last time. And that was written 2,000 years ago. So throughout history, there have been uh, people, starting with Haman, I guess, and uh, you can, Antiochus the IV, uh, certainly a type of the Antichrist, Adolf Hitler, and on and on and on. So there are certainly... Uh, many types, many individuals who have those characteristics without being the Antichrist, but certainly uh, even today, you know, we see that there are some leaders who are anti-Semitic, and that certainly would put them in the ballpark of being a type of uh, of the Antichrist. Well, dear brother, this has been uh, tremendous. You've got one more tape, The Seven Pillars of Biblical History, Disc 6. Uh, we won't have time to go over that, but my, I think you've given a preview of what this six-tape series or six-disc uh, series is all about, and love you in the Lord. Thank you for, for sharing all of this, and I'm sure our listeners just love the truth that you're bringing out. Well, thank you, Brother Larry. Thank you for having me on, and I appreciate you.